Good morning, Mountain Movers. Good morning also to our online family. So we've made it to December. Can you believe it? We are already in December 2023. We made it. And by now, you are probably well on your way to the big day, Christmas Day. It's coming. It's coming sooner than you think. And if you're like most people, you're, you're probably in a, a process of planning and preparation, uh, getting ready for that big day where you give the gift, the present. And uh, we call it a, a three-stage strategy. And just tell me if this sounds familiar. You have the planning period, and that's where you look at your budget so you don't go broke. Uh, that's where you, uh, you just begin to make a list of all the, the friends, family members, uh, coworkers maybe that you're going to be buying for, um, and you start making that shopping list, okay? You start, you start working into that preparation process. So then uh, you, you, you're going through the budget, you're, you're shopping online, you're maybe hitting some stores, you're packing some gifts and wrapping them and hiding them, and then you wait for the big day, and of course, that's our favorite part. If you're like me, you love giving the gift, and, and it's, it's their pleasure, you know, that brings you so much joy. That's the payout for all of us gift givers. Amen. We love giving gifts. We love bringing that joy to the faces of those we love. So there's a process to it. And you know, God has a very similar process that he went through in preparing for the very, very first Christmas day of all time. And the best, by far the best Christmas in all of history was the day that Jesus was born. And we can see a parallel process happening. Just like we prepare for Christmas, God prepared for that big day. Except it didn't take him like one month or one year like it takes us. It took him hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and even thousands of years to prepare for that big day. But how many of you guys would agree that in life, just in general, timing is everything? Have you learned that just... Just whether you're a believer or you're not, it's just kind of, that's just life, right? Timing is important. Timing is everything. I think about when, uh, you know, God had just called me into, into ministry and, uh, and he spoke this whole concept to me, mountain movers. And to be honest, I didn't even know at the time that it was going to be a church. Um, but he just kind of dropped this concept in my heart. And that was in, uh, I think, late 98, maybe 99, when he showed me that. And for those of you that know, uh, Mountain Movers began in 2007. So there was a few years that transpired from the time that God showed me Mountain Movers and the time that Mountain Movers actually came to be. And um, so for me, the whole time, this idea, this concept is stirring in my heart, like, what is this thing? What is this Mountain Movers all about? So I start going to the drawing board. If you're like me, you know, uh, God shows you something and you just start trying to figure it out, right? You start trying to work out all the details and you start trying to put the puzzle pieces together. I can take you back to journals that I had um, where I was drawing pictures of buildings and different concepts. I love drawing buildings and architecture and all this. And I'm thinking of all these concepts and, and what this ministry will look like. Again, I didn't even really know it was going to be a church. But it's interesting how we're really just human nature. We're impatient. We're, we're so impatient. You know, you, you, maybe God's promised you something in his word, or maybe he's spoken something through his Holy Spirit to your heart. And we just get to going, just trying to figure out, okay, when is this going to happen? Like, God already, I mean, when are you going to just lay it down and let this promise come to pass? Because I don't like waiting. How many of you guys like waiting? Raise your hand if you like waiting. Anybody? No, me neither. I don't like waiting. You just but got 100% timing, participation. 100% participation. Because you didn't ask I need hand. to learn to ask <laughs> questions like that where I get 100% participation. Everybody online as well. Nobody responded. That's perfect. But, you know, think about it. Timing is, is, is so important. Imagine if God would have thrown me right into starting this church as soon as he showed me that. Well, you might ask yourself, what transpired in the, that gap of years before we started the church? Well, the first thing is God called me to college, right? I had to go learn, right, how to, how to study God's word and how to teach God's word and how to develop leaders and how to manage, you know, business and all those things. And there was a lot to learn over the course of four or five years. But then something really huge that happened was she found me. <laughs> Maybe it's the other way around. Nonetheless, we were married during that time frame we met in college. I couldn't have started this church without her. That, that, there's no way it would have even gotten off the ground. So, so think about it. God was preparing us the whole time 
for the promise to come to pass. What is God preparing you for right now that you may not even realize that you're just practicing. He has you in a practicing process. He's, he's trying to teach you things. He's trying to show you, you know how much faith I had to learn to have before he brought us out in the middle of nowhere in a mobile home with our four babies and diapers and little to no money and one couple on a couch and said, start a church. <laughs> do you know what he had to do with our faith yeah. over that course of years in that window of time? Do you know what he had to do in us? Right. And you might be just really... Just at a season where you're just like, God, come on already. When? When God is saying, you're not ready. I'm trying to teach you some things. I'm trying to show you some things. I'm trying to help you to become the person that you're going to need to be in the moment when that promise that I've been reserving for you comes to pass. But you need to step into being that person that I've called you to be. Some of you in the room, I'm just going to step on your toes because I love you. You're not ready. You're not ready. That's why every day is important. Every week is important. It's important that you grow, you mature in your faith day after day, week after week, you grow in the things of God so you can learn to listen to God, so you can learn to obey God, so you can learn to trust God. Because there's some things coming down the pike that you don't see, but God does, and he's preparing you for it even now. As I speak, he's preparing you for it right now. Timing is everything. Look at somebody and say, timing is everything. You know, if you have children, I think that you would resonate with this. And that is a lot of times our kids think that they're ready for things before they're really ready. And as parents, we know it. We can see it. You know, there's a time when you can actually put your kid behind the wheel of a car and let them drive. And there's a time when you can't. There's a time for different things in their life. And as parents, we try to explain that. And our kids are almost all at that adult stage now. And so there's lots of things that they're talking about. And we're like, I don't think you're ready for that just yet. And you know, they don't like hearing that. It's like, oh, you don't believe in me. You don't trust me. You won't give me that amount of money that I need. Just go start that business. And we were literally just laughing. I'll just give you a behind the scene take. Okay. Mm. I don't think she's in here. One of our girls was in the back just moments ago. We are getting ready. Brandy's finishing up offering. We are at the curtain. We're ready to walk out the door. And my daughter looks at me and she said, there's a business getting like, there's a business in town that's going to be sold. She just heard about it. She said, mom, she said, this is an awesome storefront. This is a great opportunity. Mom, we need to buy this business. I'm like, Mia, we are preaching in 30 seconds. Oh, I just told you who it was. Dang it. Like, okay, I just wanted to tell you. We'll talk later. Shh, oh don't tell her. So we and I was can't like, for giving birth we'll to four talk entrepreneurs. About that later. But the funny thing is, in my brain, I'm like, girl, you're in college. Now's not the time. We're not investing in a business right now. But you know what? She didn't want to hear that, so I didn't tell her that. So don't go telling her that, okay? I'm going to get right, in trouble. So listen, I'm going to get in trouble because I'm about to give you a second service bonus. Mm. You guys don't get this. Very often. You don't. You're the middle service. Third service normally gets the bonus because things just come to us after preaching it twice. And by the third time, I was like, you know, this story would really fit. I just thought of one. So I'm going to share it with you. Timing is everything. And how often do we just push the limits and try to just get a little before our time? One night I was at um, Misty's church where she grew up and I was talking to her dad in the, in the lobby. It was nighttime. No one was there. It was just us. And I had the kids, they were all in the van, but they were very, very little. It was Ty and Mia and Blake. And Ty was probably, what would you say, maybe three, probably. The girls were very, very little. So so the girls would have been uh, two, okay, maybe a little younger. And so uh, her dad, Ron, and I are standing in the the foyer there, and we're talking, and the, the, the sweet minivan was pointing towards us. The headlights were shining in the lobby. It's nighttime. Hold on. Let, let me preface. I'm not with you. You're not with me. She's not with me. Okay. For, first I'm off. On, I, that's a good preface. I'm on dad duty. <laughs> on dad duty. Okay. So. He left three so, kids. Hold on. As any good dad in, would hold do. Hold on. Hold on. He left three kids strapped into a running car. It was cold. It was cold. But in his brain, in his defense, he thought they're strapped in. They can't escape. Locked in, secured. Go ahead. It's winter time. It's cold. The van is running. They're locked in. So as I'm having this conversation with her dad, from time to time, as any good dad would do, because I'm responsible, (laughs) 
I look over and just make sure all is good, okay? Look good, you know, everything looks good. We're having a conversation. Everything's cool. Having a conversation, I look and the van is gone. <laughs> no more headlights, no more van, it's gone. And I'm talking around, oh my God, it! <laughs> and I take off running outside and the van is in the parking lot going backwards in circles. And I ran up. You can't make this stuff up. I ran up to the door and I pull open the car door and Ty is obviously out of his car seat. And he goes, Dad, 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 I drove to ban. I get a little speech impediment. I drove to ban. I drove to ban. I drove to ban. And the girls, they're just like, no, my little, my little girls are twins. They're strapped in. They're like, oh my God, you almost killed us. You idiot. You had one job and you almost killed us. He wanted to drive. I get it, but it was a little before his time. Timing is everything. The sad reality is when he came home, he knew he had to tell me because he knew my dad would tell me. And so he comes Dead in man. and he tries to set the scene and it, very calmly, it was all under control, you know, and he gets to that part and my, my, I mean, my face is white because I'm thinking what could have happened, though it did not, all my kids were there. And as he's telling me, I'm like, did you bust his rear end? Like, did you did you bring down the hammer? And Brad goes, are you kidding, Misty? He was so proud. He was proud. so proud of himself. Like, there was no <laughs> like way. Like, he had conquered the world. I was like, well, then you should be beat because somebody needs a spanking in this process right here. But Ty thought he was ready. He was not. Timing is everything. All right. Go to your word. We're going to Galatians chapter 4. We're going to start reading in verse 4 and 5 as we dive into part 2, the preparation. It says this, but when the right time came, say the right time. Right. Timing is everything. When the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom. Last week we talked about redemption meaning to buy back. This is what we're talking about, to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us into his very own children. We're going to look at this first part, when the right time came. What we're talking about in this passage is that when God had every detail in place, every preparation made, then, and only then, did he send Jesus into the world. You know, for us, some people, you're really detail-oriented. Other people, you're like, eh, wing it. Like, don't care. God is a very, very detail-oriented God. He's into the details. He's into preparing. And so today, we're going to lay out for you four things that were major that God needed to prepare before he sent his son. A lot of times, Brad, you mentioned this in first service, but a lot of times we think about, you know, Adam and Eve messes up in Genesis chapter three. Why didn't immediately like God send his son? Why did he go through hundreds of years and make humanity wait for the savior? Well, we're going to show you part of the reason today why God's timing was a lot longer than we would have liked it. So the first thing that we need to understand that he did is God chose a bloodline. That is a family. Each of us have blood running through our veins and you have a family, you have a lineage. And as God looked down to earth and as he prepared to send his son, he needed to choose a family. Who was Jesus going to be, whose family was he going to be born into? So I want to show you in Genesis chapter 12, verses one through three, God chooses the family. It says this, the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people on the earth will be blessed through you. Now, Abram is a guy that you probably have heard by the name of Abraham, and that is because his original name was Abram. When God came to him and he basically chose him to be the father of the Jewish nation, he was 75 years old and he did not have any kids. He and his wife were really past the age of childbearing and he did not think he would ever have children. Yet God comes to him and he lays down this promise. And I want you to see a couple things in this promise. He says, all people on the earth will be blessed through you. 
When we see that all people in the earth will be blessed through you, he's talking about the fact that Jesus would come through Abraham's lineage. And because Jesus came into the world, all humanity were going to have the opportunity for salvation. But I wanna show you something else that's really important in this verse. It says, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. And this is just a side note that you need to understand as a believer, this is why we stand with Israel. The reason we stand with Israel is because of the promise that God gave to Abraham that day. He said, I will bless those who bless the nation of Israel and I will put a curse on those who do not. And so right now, as the world is watching Israel, let me just tell you, you know, for all of time, Israel has been a target. Why? Why is this little nation that's smaller than New Jersey, the state of New Jersey in the United States of America, why is this tiny nation get all this attention? Why does anybody care? Because the enemy hates the nation of Israel. Satan knows God's plan. He knows that's God's chosen people. Even when all the people don't recognize and understand all of it, that some of them have turned their back. They don't believe that Jesus is really the Messiah. They are still God's chosen people. And so as a believer, there's no if, ands, or buts. If you call yourself a believer, you stand with Israel. Give God a hand. The final thing that we see in this passage, we see that word all, all people. God in this one little verse lays it out that though he chooses a bloodline, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, Abraham's lineage, he also makes a way for everyone else, which would be the Gentiles. So if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. So if you're in this room right now and you're wondering, am I a Jew or a Gentile? Because there's only two in the Bible. If you're not Jewish descent, then we're all Gentiles. And so in this passage, it literally says all people that would include you and I. And I want to show you in Romans chapter 11, how this worked out. The apostle Paul says in verse 17, but some of these branches from Abraham's tree, we're talking about Abraham's lineage. Some of the people of Israel have broken off. And what he was talking about is that they didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. Okay, they turn their back on God. And you Gentiles who were branches from a wild olive tree have been grafted in. Say grafted in. So now you also receive the blessing God had promised to Abraham and his children, sharing the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. And so we see that from the very moment that God chooses the bloodline, he plans for not only a redemption for the Jewish people, but also for the Gentiles. It says that we're grafted in and literally what that means, if you take two branches and you bring them together and like in in layman's term, tape them together and plant them, they would grow up together. And that's what God did for the Gentile people. That's what he did for you and I. He grafted us in, allowing us the opportunity to also be a part of the promise. So that was the first thing that he had to do. He had to make preparation through the bloodline. The second thing he had to do is he prepared the law. Now, when we talk about the law, obviously we're talking about rules and regulations. We're talking about the law of God that was given to Moses. And you know, I don't know about you, I don't really love rules, don't really, you know, don't really like all of that, especially when I was young. But I think we would all agree that rules and laws prevent chaos right? You get out on the road and you don't really like there being a speed limit, but I promise you that that speed limit protects us and saves many lives, right? Well, the law was given to the nation of Israel as a means of establishing this nation, but also to help them to recognize that they had a problem, okay? God wanted them to see that they didn't live up to his standard and that they were really going to need a savior. That was part of the reason for the law. And I'm gonna show this to you. In Galatians chapter three and verse 19, it says, why then was the law given? Because let me help you to think about it. The Jewish people got so stuck on the law that by the time we roll into the New Testament, as most of you would know, that it was the religious people who wanted Jesus crucified. 
okay? So if you understand the story even a little bit, it, it is so confusing because you're like, if these were religious people, why did they want to kill Jesus? That doesn't make any sense. Well, because Jesus came and ruffled everybody's feathers because they loved the law, which was religion. It was all the rituals that they had been following all of these years. So Paul is helping the church in Galatia to understand, well, why was the law even ever given? Here's the reason. Verse 19 he says, why was the law given? It was given alongside the promise. What was the promise? I just read it to you that there was going to be a Messiah. Jesus was going to come through Abraham's lineage. It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. So the law was given to show people their sins because they would need to realize we don't live up to God's standards. There's not one of us that can live up to his standards. Thus, we need a savior. It went on to say, but the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. And I think this is really interesting because that is exactly what frustrated all of the religious people in the New Testament was that when Jesus came, they were saying, you can't just do away with the law. And he was saying, I didn't come to do away with it. I came to fulfill it. We don't need it anymore because I'm here. But they couldn't understand that. We didn't need temporary sacrifices. We don't need the atonement of bulls and goats anymore. You see, I came and once and for all, I'm going to lay down my life. I'm going to shed my blood so that every single one of you would be able to not just have a temporary covering of your sins, but completely your sins taken away as far as the east is from the west that's what he came to do they didn't fully understand it and you know so often even in our life as God is working and he's preparing things we miss it we get stuck in one season Oof, this is gonna hurt we get stuck in a season and we don't realize that that season was a season of preparation for something else and that's exactly where the religious people were. They were in this season and they'd been there for a long time. And God is like, this was just a season. It was never meant to where you were going to camp forever. I'm trying to move you into something new and something better, but you're missing it. You got to trust the process as God prepares us for the next thing. The third way that God was preparing is he was preparing, preparing our hearts through the promise. And what we mean by that is if you look over all the many, many years um, as Misty was saying, from, from Genesis all the way to the genealogy of Jesus Christ, all those years, God was showing us through his word and through history, his signs and wonders. He was speaking through the prophets. And what he was doing was he was proving himself all along the way that, hey, this is just a reminder, you can trust me. Even when it doesn't make sense, even when what you see doesn't make sense, and you can't quite put two and two together, just know this, that I'm at work even when it doesn't feel like I'm working. And you need to know this, in your own walk with God, in your relationship with God, God is always at work. And you really have to just learn to trust the process. But all this time, he was preparing our hearts, showing us, showing us that he was God and that he had a plan and he was working the plan, but we needed to wait. We needed to be patient because in due time, God was going to show up on his promise. Another thing that he did during this time frame is he prepared the world for the coming of Jesus. Now, what you think about this, this is going to blow your mind. There was about 400 years that transpired from the last words of Malachi, the prophet. That's the last book of the old Testament. From that moment when Malachi wrote the words that God told him to write down, 400 years took place, and they call them the years of silence, 400 years of silence before the apostles started speaking up and journaling, if you will, what they were experiencing as they were um, living with Jesus and doing ministry with Jesus. 400 years of silence. You know what this did for the Jews? This caused them to really question where God was. This made them feel as a nation who God had promised all these wonderful things. He had promised uh, a lineage and relationship and all these wonderful things. And they felt like God had maybe turned his back on them. They felt like maybe God had forgotten about them. Has that ever been you? You just feel like, man, God, where are you? Like, I feel such a dry season right now. I feel like I'm walking around out in the wilderness and I just don't sense your presence in my life. I feel like you're not talking to me. I feel like you're not guiding me. You know, there's real value in those moments in our life because it really tests our faith and it bids the question, do I really trust God and do I really take him at his word or do I not? 
You know, there's, there's, there's value in God being quiet. Those are actually some of the most forming moments where God is cultivating us and he's speaking to us really not, not just, not through his voice, obviously, but through his word. You know, so many times we like to associate our relationship with God based on feelings, you know, and feelings are good. God's given us emotion. He's given us feelings. But we, what we need to learn to do is trust him at his word yeah. because that's where, where faith begins is hearing, God, what have you said? In moments when I can't really hear you, what can, can I look back and see what have you said? Because I know I can bank on that. I can take that to the bank and nothing else really matters, okay? So in your own walk with God, trust the process. But over these 400 years of silence, okay, 400 years. Here's what was really taking place behind the scenes. God was orchestrating things. He was bringing alignment all around the world. Check this out. All, all the political changes that was taking place. I'm going to give you a little uh, history lesson, okay? H um, how many of you guys have heard of Alexander the Great? Raise your hand, okay? All right. Alexander the Great uh, initiated the Roman Empire, okay? So, so this is like one bad dude. And he, he raised up an incredible military power that really just began kicking tail and taking names and just started taking over countries all over the place, all over uh, what is known as modern-day Europe into the Middle East. They just started taking over country after country after country after country. Now, you might ask yourself why that is so important, but check this out. What they were doing is they were annexing the borders of, of the, 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 the empire, of the Roman Empire. So they were, they were pulling in all these other countries that they were winning over, and they were changing the language. So this is the Greek culture. So as, as Alexander the Great was taking over all these other countries, he's taking with him the Greek language, and he's establishing libraries and establishing education. This was very intentional because he wanted to expand the kingdom of the Roman Empire. So as he's doing this, guess what happens? The Old Testament, which was only in Hebrew, now, because it's like English is the common language all over the world. We went to Israel. We were there for like 10, 12 days, and almost everybody we talked to spoke English. It was, it was great, you know, for us, you know. But, but you know, the language is, is common. But in those days, the Greek language became the common language. So what they did was they translated the Jewish writings of the Old Testament into Greek so that the world could understand it. So here's what this did. This opened up a door for all the rest of the world to better understand the God of the Hebrew people. God was setting the stage. He was laying a foundation and he was working all these things together so that he could accomplish his will in the end. Check this out. The other things that happened is the Romans established roads. They established travel routes and this, this infrastructure, if you will. Have you ever heard the phrase, all roads lead to Rome? Have you ever heard that before? That's a real thing. It's because they are the ones that established all these roads to all these countries that they took over. So literally from Rome, you could look at a map and you could see roads all over the place. What this did was it, it created a travel route for people to go all over the world. Also, because they had annexed all these other countries, citizens of the Roman Empire could travel freely. They could go from one nation to the next. And because of the, the order that had taken place, because of the law that was in place, because the, there was Roman soldiers everywhere, they were able to travel pretty safely. And how many of you guys know, whether you agree with a dictatorship taking over or not, when you have a strong military power in place, how many of you guys know there is a season of peace because ain't nobody going to jack with you when you got the biggest, baddest army? You guys know that. So that's what had happened. Rome was so big and bad, nobody was wanting to take them on. So the world was truly in a season and an era of peace. So people could travel. They could go from country to country. There was one language that had pulled them all together. So what this is doing is this is setting up this incredibly intricate orchestrated system for preparing the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, if Jesus would have come just a hundred years before he did, the world would not have been ready for the gospel. God's timing was insanely precise and perfect. God made the, the world exactly what he wanted it to be and timed it with the birth of Jesus Christ so that when he was born, they could take that message, take it with a language in the Septuagint, which was the, the, the Hebrew scriptures translated to Greek, and they could take the gospel message all over the entire world. You know, God's doing the same thing with your life right now, but many of you don't even see it. He is orchestrating. He is coordinating. He is aligning all of these things in your life 
but you don't see it. The Jews didn't see it for 400 years. They thought that God had turned his back on them, but he was busy working. They didn't see him at work, but behind the scenes, he was busy working. Don't think because you don't see God moving in your life that God isn't working all things together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his, his glory. You are called by Jesus, and he is working things together for your good and for his glory. You can give God praise. You guys are killing me. <laughs> Think about it. Think, think about the intentionality and the timing over hundreds and hundreds of years. And you, and you ask God, where are you? What are you doing? Do you even know what you're doing? How many of us have asked that question? Don't raise your hand. But you've asked that question. God, do you even know what you're doing? Yes. He knows what he's doing. Look at Galatians 4. In verse 4, we read this earlier, but look at that phrase one more time. When the right time came. There's a right time in your life for the things that God has promised you according to his word. There's a right time for everything. And the reality is we're just not good at being patient. And some of us, more than others, are just really not good at trusting God and taking him at his word. I'm here to tell you today, you can trust God. God. You can trust God and you can trust his process. I want to close with this scripture found in Romans. This is a letter written by Paul to the church in Rome. And it's found in chapter 15 and verse 12 reads, this is a quote. He's quoting the prophet Isaiah. Remember I said that part of God's preparation was the signs and the wonders and the prophets and he spoke through people to foretell of the future of the coming of Jesus. He's quoting Isaiah, one of the greatest prophets of all time. And Isaiah said this, the heir to David's throne will come. This is many, 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 many years before Jesus ever came on the scene. The prophet wrote that he will come and he will rule over the, not the Jews, but the Gentiles. They will place their hope on him. And this is Paul's prayer. He says, I pray that God, the source of hope, who is the source of hope? God is. My prayer is that he will fill you completely. Is that partially? That he would fill you completely with joy and peace, but it's conditional. If you want to experience the joy and the peace of God, during this countdown to Christmas, you're going to have to trust in Him. And when you learn to trust in God, then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Trust God's process. Trust God's timing. Know that he is in control, that he is sovereign and he is powerful and he is strong and he is able. Trust God's process. If you've been a believer any length of time, you can look back in your life and you can see he was faithful then. And if he was faithful then, he'll do it again and again and again and again and again. You can trust God and take him at his word. Let's pray today. Father, God, I pray over every person that is in this room and every person that is joining us online today, God. And Lord, I can just see in my, in my spirit and in my heart today, God, the many, many people who have been truly aggravated and irritated and afraid and confused because they have felt like maybe you left them or that you didn't care or that you were unaware. And God, we just simply know today that that's not true. I pray, Lord, for any of those that have been questioning or doubting or experiencing confusion in any way, God, in uncertain times, I pray right now, God, that you would just bless them with a dose of hope and peace, God, through the trust that they have in you. I pray, God, that you would see our hearts today as your people, that we would be a people who trust you, that trust your process, that take you at your word, help us to be patient, Help us to be understanding. Help us to know beyond the shadow of a doubt, God, that you are work at work even when we don't see you working. With heads bowed and eyes closed today, 
I'm gonna ask you the most important question that you will ever be asked on this side of heaven. And that is, have you made Jesus your personal Lord and Savior? Have you trusted in Christ? Have you trusted the process? He died for your sins. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. By His blood, we have overcome. Through the power of the resurrection, we've been given hope and a future in Him and the power to do everything He's called us to do. Do you know Him? Do you have a real relationship with Him today? I'm not asking if you have religion. I'm not asking if you've done this or you've done that. I'm asking... Do you have a relationship with him that is real? Has your life changed? Is your life contagious? Are you so excited about Jesus and what he's done in your life, you can't shut up about it? That's when you really know that you're saved. It's the fruit of salvation. Real, life-changing relationship with Jesus that's contagious. People should want to have what you have. If there's any part of you that says, I don't have that. I thought I did, but I don't. Why don't you just make sure today that your life is right with God? Why don't you make sure today that you've made heaven your home? Why don't you make sure today that you're living a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus that's contagious? You can do that by simply asking God right now to forgive you of your sins. Believe in your heart that Jesus truly is who he says he is, the son of God who takes away the sins of the world. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. With heads bowed and eyes closed, are you one of them that's making that decision right now? We're gonna pray as a church family, but as we do, I just, I wanna know who that is in this room today. So I'm gonna be praying for you this week. If you're in the room, just slip your hand up if you would. And if you're watching online, just comment all in in the comment section below. Thank you, I see your hands up in the bleachers. Three people giving their lives to Jesus. Thank you, anybody else today? Thank you, Lord. God, thank you so much. Anyone else? I see your hand up in the bleachers on my right. Thank you. Four people giving their lives to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. These people are making heaven their home. I see your hand on my left. I see you up front. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. Praise the Lord. I see your hand on my right. Yes, Lord. Thank you. I see your hand at the very back on my right. Yes, God. Sweet Holy Spirit, thank you, Father God. Let's pray this prayer together as a church family supporting those who have made that decision. Father, please forgive me of my sins. I believe Jesus has taken away my sins. I confess him as Lord of my life. It's only through him I can be saved. God, help me to trust you. Help me to trust your process. Your timing is perfect. In Jesus' name, amen.